October 1943. Japanese forces in Thailand celebrate the completion of what would become known as the Death Railway. いや、気づいことはですけどね。うん。人を殺すということは絶対にしてはいけないなと思いました。はい。それだけ。I used to say Oh, you know, you fancy you buying a Japanese car or buying a Japanese television or something like that. And I just thought that was a load of nonsense because that didn't make any difference. I had the worst uh, nightmare ten days ago. Now that's 70 odd years after. 犠牲というよりもそういう犠牲なんてのは考えないでまた犠牲が発生するとそのそういうことは考えが浮かばなかったんだ。A third of a million men were forced to work on the railway. Over 100,000 died. My original group was 1,700 strong. By the time that uh, the railway was finished, uh, there were only 400 left. By 1941, the Second World War had been raging across Europe for several years and was not going the Allies' way. Setback followed setback. In the Far East, Germany's ally Japan attacked US forces at Pearl Harbor, invaded territories across the Pacific, and rapidly advanced towards Malaya and the impregnable British fortress of Singapore. Thousands of British and Australian troops were sent to defend the colony. For many, this was to be the defining moment of their lives. People ask me, how is it that you reach the age of 100? I said, so many times, I have just missed death. This has happened to me so often. And I said, it's so much of my life, it's been luck. I don't feel old, I don't want to feel old. But, uh, and I, I think it's preposterous when I suddenly you know, have a 93rd birthday, this is crazy. But, so, uh, you know, it's, it's just that life is it's full and rich and interesting, and, and I love it. You know? I'm I had never spoken about it, apart a bit with my family, but never really. There's a sort of certain point where you don't um, want to talk about it.今の経験を生かしながら余生を有意義に先ほど申し上げた通りの生活をして後世にその平和と命の大切を伝えたいと念願しております。Japanese were, I suppose, only about 100k up 
the Malay Peninsula from Singapore when we got there. They were dropping bombs on the docks. They killed a lot of people in the shipping and they came in and the docks were full of people trying to get away. It was absolutely tragic. We were the last ship in the convoy. It was about 11 o'clock in the morning uh, when we were going in there and uh, a flight of bombers come over, peeled off one at a time, come in bombers. We had got it several times. She started to burn like, and there was thick columns of black smoke coming along the deck. And uh, I said to my mate, Pat Reedy, I'm, I'm going over the side. So I can leave him now. He's, we had crouched down by the cabins. And I walk, I get up on the rail, stand up on the rail. I said to him, come on, Pat, I'm going. It's the last I've seen of him. In this same dark, steaming tropical jungle, men of both the British and Imperial forces go through an intensive OC2 training course to fulfil the need for officers of the Malayan Defence Force. Using collapsible boats, they perfect themselves in the methods of jungle warfare. It was terribly British stuff, really. You know, tremendously British, and, and uh, for a time when we should have been training, we didn't. And so we went really into, into war, not well trained at all. I mean, we were hardly trained. It was crazy. The jungle holds many a secret to counter any move directed against Singapore or Australia. Absolutely no preparation whatsoever had been done, even to clear a field of fire so that you could see what you were doing, because we just faced mangrove swamps. The Japanese, they had tanks, they had armoured cars, but they also had bicycles, and those bicycles won their war. They came down Malaya like a, a wire through cheese. Thirty-six thousand Japanese soldiers closed in on Singapore. Facing them were almost eighty-five thousand British and Allied troops. But the Japanese were motivated, experienced, and expert at jungle warfare. The Allies found themselves constantly outflanked and outfought. So we had this brief spell of of fighting, and then a certain amount of um, fairly close contact fighting, which is, which is horrific. We were actually under mortar fire, and uh, the, my colonel literally lost his head. There's no question, I was always scared stiff um, uh, when one had shells landing near one. Despite fierce and stubborn fighting, the Japanese advance continued to close in on Singapore. Winston Churchill warned his generals that surrender was out of the question. We had read the rumors that the Japanese didn't take prisoners, like, you know, so we didn't know what was going to happen, like, you know. But um, it was a, a terrible, terrible reflection of the, um, the powers that be of ours that were running that show out there, like, you know. It should never have happened. February the 15th, 1942, and the unthinkable did happen. The British commander, General Percival, surrendered Singapore to the Japanese. The white flag went up at uh, about four o'clock on the Sunday. Churchill would later describe this as the worst moment of the war. The extraordinary thing is that uh, the Japs, of course, were completely amazed at having captured so many prisoners. In all, 130,000 men were captured during this short campaign. To add to the humiliation of defeat, they were forced to watch the victorious Japanese generals drive by. The Allied prisoners were marched up to the northern tip of Singapore, to the military base, Changi. We learned that the uh, that everyone was going out to this Changi area, and they marched out, it's 18 miles. People say, you know, what's it like being taken to prison for? Chaos, at the, uh, the, the fall of Singapore in every way, and no law and things. 
And when things began to break down, which they did very quickly, um, malaria started. And then people got dysentery. The Japs, as part of this, they literally brought out lorry loads of barbed wire, which they then told us to put up round a certain perimeter. And that was the first time we were actually, you could say, we were in a prison camp. You, you have to, you learn Japanese or pseudo-Japanese and I can still swear in Japanese, but I've forgotten all my Japanese. They would point to your shoes and say, Nemoga, meaning, what, what is the name of it? And so you would say, shit, you see. And so they would go around pointing at other people's good boots, pointing and say, oh, you got, you number one shit guy, meaning you had a very good pair of boots. And, and it was hilarious because we had a lot of fun for about two weeks, and then they suddenly got the message through an interpreter, and then, and then we had to learn uh, Japanese orders. The Imperial Army had a very tight grip on Japanese society. They'd been fighting a war in the Far East since the mid-1930s and were the driving force behind Japan's territorial ambitions. All young men were conscripted at 21 into a tough and brutal training program. え、大したいと思っておりませんけれども、国の定めであって兵役の義務でいかなくてはいけない務めであったから行きました。いや、なれませんよ。大変辛かったです。一時、あの、私の戦友もおりましたけれども、おい、死の会う人も出てきておりました。訓練の厳しさに耐えかねて、はい。夜寝台に潜るとき、ベッドに潜るときには涙が自然と流れてくるような日々が続きましたけど、それも強い兵隊を作るための基礎教育だと思って我慢頑張りました。by June 1942, the Japanese advance had continued across the Pacific and up into Burma towards India. With an urgent need to move supplies, the solution was to dust off an old British plan to build a railway. The railway itself was only about 415 kilometers long. Well, that, that's not an enormous distance at all. To, to link it up with, with Rangoon, so they could bring people to Saigon, cross to Bangkok, and then take them on the railway, right up through to the Burmese frontier. So really, the railway was not a long railway in, in those, those terms, but it was the most hellish condition to make it. The Japanese realized they had a vast pool of potential labor in the prisoners at Changi. Things always change in these camps, and uh, about seven months later, I was called to the orderly office and told I was put on a draft to go to a holiday camp. There was about 600 of us that were selected, and um, we were taken down to Singapore and loaded on the trucks. And then we had a train journey to Thailand, from Singapore. There were 32 in my own particular truck, and uh, that meant that only a certain small percentage could actually sit down at any one time. And you had all your kit was stuck in the centre, like, you know. There was no sanitary conditions at all, like, you know, absolutely appalling. This is where the real uh, degradation starts. 
and that journey lasted five days. We went up to the first place we stopped in Thailand was a place called Ban Pong. That was um, an ex-Japanese camp there. There was a Japs had been stationed in there, but the camp was under about a foot of water. I, I had a large box of Windsor Newton watercolors and. Uh, I had to throw the box away because there'd been two of us, but I kept about six or eight or ten those little palettes. And they, of all things, those little paints lasted me for as long as I wanted them. And we were taken up the river. We were going to start up the transit camps. And they dropped us off then at 20 mile intervals to go in into the jungle and start clearing the jungle because there would be the main body of men coming from Singapore and they would be marching up the jungle track that followed the River Kwai. And then we were told all men march. 150 kilometers. I mean, the question of escaping was, was something that one occasionally thought about, but very quickly dismissed, because you had at least 1,200 miles of sea with lots of islands in between, admittedly, but 1,200 miles before you could get to safety, or 1,200 miles up country onto the Burma Front. If you fell by the wayside, couldn't go any further, and nobody could help you, you were left to die, or they made sure you died. And it's called the Death March. The POWs, already weak and ill, were forced to build a railway track for the Japanese through the mountainous jungle terrain. Then we had to climb up about a thousand feet. And it's during the monsoon, of course, and it was just appalling. He took two steps and slid back two. It was a thick jungle there, and uh, we started clearing the jungle for the right where the railway tra trace was going to go through. So that was the first introduction to the extra job. And so it gradually got worse from then. <laughs> まあ、あとになってはまた逆に作戦をやら実施した関係からね、たくさんの人が死んでると同時にですね。薄そうたるビルマの密林を突いて今未開地の開拓が力強く推し進められています。新しいビルマの建設は1日ごとに進んでいきます。They had so much cheap labor like apart from us. They had the the native populations of these places that they took over, like, you know. They had brought up something like about a couple of hundred thousand natives from down in Malaya and that, like, you know, with promises of uh, all great life, but lots of them died in the jungle there, yeah. I forget how long, but uh, two or three months, it was monsoon. For the first uh, quite a few weeks at this camp, where it had no roofs, we just uh, ate, worked, slept under the rain. The most 
頂上が作った頂上長さだと思われますよ、うん、だからそういうところでまだ作り直すとかねそういうのが一番大雨が一番怖かったですねで向こうでは何でもかんでもある It was really a problem of supply. The only communication was the river. And being a time of the monsoon, the rivers tended to flood. And this rendered it almost impossible for supplies to get up. All we got was uh, supposed to be 250 grams of rice. Um, that usually came in the form of uh, rice uh, full of weevils and so forth. So we ate any vegetation that we could. Snakes were very good to eat, if you could get, get them. The first one I killed was by accident, and, and I, I just banged. It, it takes a lot to kill a snake because they thrash, you know, a tremendous amount. Of and I said, we've got something to, to eat, you said. So do you, do you know what you've just killed? And I said, no. He said, well, that's a king cobra. And, and I hadn't the faint tonight <laughs> or this thing. But it didn't matter, really. The lizards were quite nice. They were quite big. They were, could be up to about 18 inches long, quite big, like, you know. And you just kill them, skin them, and cook them, either grill them or put them in some water and cook them <laughs> in a pot. <laughs> The men were now starving, but the Japanese had refused to sign the Geneva Convention, which protected the rights of prisoners of war. If our men misbehaved, as the Japanese said, the misbehavior was, was nearly always stealing food, then we were all, as officers, lined up and, and were, had what's called bintos. Uh, that is, a, an officer, a Japanese officer, would come up and give you a really hard bang on your face and so on. Uh, in front of all the men to, to, to try and teach them that they, they shouldn't seal, you see. POW camp guard was trained in the Japanese military camp for Fusan ago for about five, hour, five months, and uh, they were hitting almost every day according to the Japanese training style. <laughs> あつかった範囲内じゃ、そういう虐待なんてことは考えられなかったですね。結局鉄道隊っていうのは普段からも知ったんがの協力をやった時も現地リンを7000人もブラックから集めて。なんてもんでオーディニーチャパニーズピープル
you start to feel faint very quickly. Um, and so you would drop the stone. So we learnt you drop the stone fairly quickly and, and picked it up, um, which, which was better than collapsing, because once you collapse on the ground, then you're not sure about and kicks you all over the place. So you probably begin more damage to, to, to fainting than... So you had to play the game, really. So I was going back through the latrine one night and one of these Korean guards started to be rather sexual with me and I, without thinking, I just kicked him in a spot where no man wants to be kicked and he fell to the ground screaming and howling. I got beaten up for a night and a day and the following night until I, I no longer remember much other than the pain and so on. And then I was put in the black hole. Um, that really was probably the one time when I felt this was the end. Uh, sweat boxes, they used to put them in, put people in. They, uh made of bamboo, I was standing up about high off the ground, and um, they were made of small, thin bamboos, constructed. They were made so that they, they weren't long enough for a man to stretch right out in, and they were so low, you know, that he couldn't sit up properly, so that you were crouped up in there, like, you know, and you could get, perhaps, you'd be sentenced to, perhaps, uh, for certain things, you get a fortnight's punishment in there. Senjou ni kagero hashi no eiga de, jiu eizo, ano, eizo ってのが eiga ni demashita desu ne. Eizo te, ro, hayaku ya ro, ro, ro ya desu. And sono, sakyo o sabotta yona shito wa, toka soi mono o yurere toko wa, eiga ni ya dete mashita kedo, ayu mono o arimasen deshita ne. By mid-1943, the Japanese were still fighting in the north of Burma. But short of supplies and troops, the war was no longer going their way. We saw uh, Japanese going up to the Burma front. We watched the Japanese troops, and they were unbelievable in what they, they uh, put up with. There were times when the treatment and even the food they got, perhaps it was generally better than ours, but not much. It was such an urgent project to get a line through so they could feed them all from the front with troops. This is what the railway was about. So there was this urgency about the whole thing. It was called the speedo movement. It got worse and worse and worse. We had to work harder and harder and so on. As anxiety to get the railway finished grew within the Japanese ranks, the death rate amongst the POWs and native workers increased dramatically. <laughs> Senseui My Sikh parade got too large. A Japanese private 
because they wanted everyone had to work work for the for, for the Japanese. A Japanese private would come along, a non-medical private, take my sick parade, and as long as a man men were fit enough to stand, then they were fit enough to work, and off he would go. Actually, the, there was order to finish the railway early, so they had to compel the sick man to work hard. One of the most difficult sections of the construction was an area called Hintok, better known as Hellfire Pass. When they were making these big cuttings, which were done largely with hammer and tap, they used a certain number of charges to blow the rock. And one of their games was, occasionally, they would fire a charge without telling anybody. So some people got very badly injured with flying sharp rock. I mean, why? You know, what's the sense of all this shit? We went out in the morning with all the tools that had been issued. And after work, when we returned, there had to be a roll call of everybody. All the tools had to be handed in. And if one was short, there were usually a few short. Uh, and we had to parade incidentally, with always, practically every day, the odd one or two dead who died out there, they had to be put down at the end, at the side, in order to prove that the uh, same number had returned as went out in the morning. Every morning, I psyched myself up to survive that day. That day only. Because every day was never as good as, as the last one. It was never good. There was never any hope. Never any hope. Because of lack of control, most of the people died was because of the sickness. Not by the being hit, cruel hit to death or uh, isn't so. But if the people sort of had a good control of themselves, they didn't drink water from the river or eat raw fish, raw fish from. If the people, POW, behaved very well, they didn't get sickness. In Kanyu camps, I think every disease imaginable was there, but the worst one with the most lives lost was cholera. And the Japanese themselves were scared. And we had to burn these bodies. That was, I think, um, perhaps the low point of my experience up there. I mean, looking back now, I can hardly believe I experienced all this. これ the medical officers, in my opinion, were absolute angels. They had no drugs to work with, not even an aspirin. The colour in the 
a hospital camp at Chunkai called Weary Dunlop, an Australian, did fantastic work. Weary Dunlop, this, this, this most wonderful Australian surgeon, a, man, a bigger man, like, a man I can't praise enough. I had something on my forehead, he was going to take it off. There wasn't any anaesthesia for it, but I think it was a melanoma or something he was worried about. And uh, beside us was another table, and there was a, uh, an Australian who was really almost a skeleton, really kneeling on it with his bum in the air, because Dunlop wanted to use a proctoscope, which was made in the camps, actually. And, and he, I remember him looking into this man's bottom, you see, and he said, and this lovely Australian voice, and he said, oh yes, he said, I think I've seen you before. And, and, I, I, and we fell, I nearly fell off the table. We were rolling about, what a lovely way to greet a friend, you know. At one camp alone, over 120 legs were amputated in a single year. Operations, mostly uh, amputations, as a result of uh, these jungle ulcers. Um, were done uh, with um, a saw borrowed from the Japanese, which they said they wanted back cleaned after, after the operation or operations. Uh, they did occasionally produce a bit of sake so that people could be put out to some extent. I said to him, I've got this also, uh, what can I do? He said, well, I'm sorry, I have nothing to give you. Uh, I don't have any drugs. But if you go down to the train, pick up maggots, count them, put them on top of your ulcer, and let the maggots do their work. I said, well, what will they do? They'll eat all the rotten flesh. And he says, with a good chance, you'll get a clean wound. I'd been badly, they'd, they'd kicked my nose in, I had a bad fractured nose and hit a hole between my eyes. I couldn't see anything in there. And I was next to an Aussie that had his leg cut off that after, that morning. A big Aussie. And uh, I mean, the, it was routine stuff when you, under the most crude circumstances. Now, we were lying on bamboo and uh, Anyway, in the middle of the hut was another man who was in my own regiment, and he had an ulcer that was getting, was granulating quite well. It was in a far better condition than hundreds of the others around him. And he was, he was kneeling up and hugging his knees and rocking like so many of the, the ulcer patients did out of sheer agony and pain. And kept on saying, I'm going to die, I'm going to die, I'm going to die. And this ulcer just said, Look, mate, he said, you're going to die. Hurry up and bloody do it. I want some sleep. He said, and this lovely old friend of mine. And we were fawning about it. I thought they were hilarious. Within two hours, he was dead. And I remember to Ozzy in the morning saying, Oh, Christ, he said, the last thing anybody ever said to him. He said, railway was finally completed in October 1943. On schedule, but at the cost of over 120,000 lives. I was thinking that that the POWs and local workers who died building the railway were buried where they fell. One life lost for every sleeper laid. The, the jungle was full of uh, British dead. You know, we buried them, a lot of them where they fell. You know, 
we left 12,000 dead up there, quite apart from the wreckage that survived, you know. But it had all been for no purpose. Within months, the war had turned against the Japanese, and the Allies started to regain lost territories. These converted hurricanes, now called hurry bombers, carried two 500-pound bombs tucked beneath the wing. Down there, somewhere in that tangled wilderness, lies their target, or rather, that's where their target lay. After this heavy pounding, there'll not be much hospitality left in it for the Japanese invader. ところ殴るとか I think some of the officers, I think Weary Dunlop had had some intimation from somewhere that things were, were getting pretty sticky. We had a huge camp with a huge pit around it, a big bun on one side, and they'd, turn, they'd, they'd put a, a machine gun in, into the wall at one end, which really told us quite a lot about what they were <laughs> intending to do anyway, but still, we didn't know. And then, of course, within about nine or ten days, they had... Hiroshima and, and, and Nagasaki, and, and, that, and that, that finished it. It was just saved by the bell, really. So, so the Genbakuwa was taken in the time, and the Genshin Bakuwa was taken in the time, and the Genshin Bakuwa was taken in the time. The Japanese were, had ceased to fight, you know, from that time onwards. So, well, we knew then that we were officially free. Japan surrendered to the Allied forces on the 2nd of September, 1945. The POWs were at last free men. had retaken Singapore and a couple of days after that they were beginning to march the Japanese by then prisoners and one of our divisional people soldiers was you know like people do sort of just watching what was going on and at one point he turned to his uh, pal and said look at those poor buggers now it's their turn and that to me sums up the attitude of um, the ordinary soldier we had a sergeant major, a, a British sergeant major, that was in our camp. Like we didn't have any officers with us. And um, what he said was, uh, he gave us a bit of good advice. He said, now, he, he advised us not to, um, to take any action against the Japanese. Um, he said, you've survived three and a half years of being prisoners. So uh, he said, no. Think of your families, don't do anything stupid that might get you killed, like, you know. But Nice Bangkok オッケー
特に対面鉄道のビルマ川の鉄道撤収作業をやってかし,しましたね。占領したもんだ占領物件だからね鉄道が。それを大国の方へ売り渡すのにちゃんと整理修理して完全なものにしておかないとそれ値段が違うんですよね。そのために我々はそれです入って仕事させられた。Japanese guards were made to carry the sick and wounded to the quay side, where landing craft will take them to the hospital ship in the bay. Other prisoners who are able to walk make their way to the landing craft, which will carry them on the first stage of a happy journey. On the far eastern shores, many have already started a longer voyage, taking them back to the land they have served so bravely. We, there was no one there to meet us, you know, it was, uh, there was no bands there to meet us or anything like that. But we were just um, taken off the boat and taken to a transit camp there in Southampton. And, uh, We were there for, uh, oh, it was only about a couple of days, like, you know. And then um, we were just stuck on a train and, and sent home. I used to go out in the morning and I'd walk the streets of Aberdeen for hours and hours then, looking, looking for somebody that I knew. I was forgetting I'd been away six and a half years. When I got back, I decided I'd forget everything. I'm going to start a new life. And I didn't join any ex-prisoner of war life or any prison or anything. I wouldn't have anything as far as I'm concerned, although I'm talking about it now. I just wouldn't talk about any of my ex-prisoner of war, my, my prison of war experiences or anything. No, I'm going to start a new life and something quite new. And I'd have nothing to do with what's happened to me. That's just happened. It's finished. It was uh, a bit overwhelming with having so many people coming to you and uh, wanting to know everything about you and all that. Like you know, they had no understanding of what um, what horrors we had lived through. Like you know, and now the comparison between uh, people's kindness and. Uh, The brutality that we had been experiencing. Came, came. That time, was, ah, just a little bit. Now, it's not like that anymore. Came, that time, was, ah, just a little bit. Now, it's not like that anymore. It's been very difficult with the family because I never spoke about it. My wife died without knowing. Mind you, she must have seen and felt the swing of moods. Uh, she must have done. Uh, and one one night, when I had a nightmare, I finished up with my hands around her throat. So at that stage, I went into the spare bedroom where there was a chair, and I used to sleep in that for weeks. I couldn't sleep properly for about ten years. That sounded a long time. But I could only just sleep under the surface. I mean, uh, during the in the camps, you just slept under the surface. You were ready to move off because they might come in and, and start beating people up, turn everybody out for a working party. You didn't know what was going to happen by day or night very often, and, uh, and so you slept like that. And I knew exactly where everything of mine was, so that I could put my hands on it. Um, especially my little drawing, few drawing things, and uh, so you were always ready to move. And when I came home, it was much the same. I would fold my clothes up, and I sit in the way I do now, and I know just where they are. Well, compensation. I think I'm right in saying. That I got thirty pounds. We all did. 
several years after the war. We were certainly the worst country of the lot of doing anything at all to get compensation from the Japs. I blame it most well on politicians and above all the Treasury because we finally got, I think the figure was £10,000, about, I'm guessing, 15 years ago, not much more, and uh, um, there weren't many left, so the Treasury obviously saved a lot of money. When they talked of trying to get some uh, financial uh, benefit out of it, that might have done a bit of good for to help to reveal some of the things for the blokes. But, um, you know, for me, the uh, I have no, as I said, no ill feeling against the Japanese at all. I mean, I meet Japanese here now, no trouble. Puni no time ni yatta da kara mo kore wa mo shikata nai na to ima demo omote masu, hai. Ma ko shochi no yo ni shishi no tetsudo to moshimashou ga takusan no hito ga kakko kara kite, ne, horo tachi mo takusan naku na te ori mo da ne, ima genzai wa hijou ni kinodoku da to omote ori masu. まあ、辛かったことは辛かったですけれども、これは軍の命令であったことですので、当時思い忘れたと辛いです。はい。今まで戦争のことを話しますと、軍国主義だとか、そういうことを言われまして、私 なんかの場合も含みてから、しばらく戦争の話はじっと大使の運で話しなかったんだけど、現在の日本の平和が保ってるのは、やっぱり異国の地に参加した尊い犠牲を張った戦友たち、それが、あの、特攻隊の人たち
um, bankers or industrialists or whatever, because there are some good, bad and indifferent anywhere. In all, I've been, I think I've just been terribly lucky. I'm very happy doing what I'm doing. And I think, I, you know, and I have no regrets, really. It doesn't matter. I've been there and I've done it. All the things that I ever wanted to do. And uh, I have no regrets. I mean, the fact that I was um, a prisoner of war was just a blip in my life, like, you know. I am determined to live and beat the Japanese because I'll outlive them all, I hope. All those who were involved. One of the most interesting parts of this was the sheer ingenuity. You put a lot of people together. There are tensmiths, there are pharmacists, chemists, all sorts of people. So you put all these people together and you can begin to start moving half the mountain. And I think that was a sort of corporate magic of the whole thing, which was so important. あの、対面鉄道建設についてお元気でおられるちょっと今写真見せてもらったですね。その方と一遍お会いしたいです。ヘレンさん、サンキュー2 day。はい、これやります。